All right, so we know different types of models and we know something about how to fit those models. So this next topic when we're talking about models is model accuracy. So what is model accuracy? Really, it's just how well the model you're trying to apply to the data describe the data. And so we're talking about regression. So there is some dependent variable or some output variable you're trying to m explain. And so how well you explain that thing is, is what model accuracy is all about. And when we talked about model fitting, we kind of already have a notion of accuracy. We're trying to get the model to fit the data. And what that means is you're minimizing typically squared error. So you're minimizing the sum of the squares of the residuals of the fit against the data. So we already had this notion of um, what it means for a model to be good. Um, but there are some more uh, tricky details here. So one is we kind of want something that we can interpret. So when we're quantifying the accuracy of a model, so let's just go to our simple case. X is trying to model Y in terms of X, and here are some data points. And suppose this is my model fit, so it's pretty good in terms of going near the data points, but it's not perfect. So we already know the notion of squared error. And so for these data points in this particular model shown in black, the squared error is 5.4. I think it literally is 5.4. I think I did it. And the problem with this is it's hard to interpret because for one thing, it's very dependent on the units that we're talking about. So the Y variable here, for if I multiplied Y by 100, um, the squared, up, squared error would go up by 100 squared, I think, <laughs> um, which just means that whatever this number is, like if someone tells you, oh, the squared error of my model was 0.1, that doesn't really tell us if it's good or bad because it is highly dependent on the scale of the Y. It's also dependent on the number of data points. So if you double the number of data points, there will be dou uh, double the number of terms going in, into the squared error, so, which just means your squared error will be du you know, about twice as large. So it's very hard to interpret. So what we need is a metric that's easier to interpret, and R squared, and the, specifically capital R squared, there's a difference. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, there's a common one. And you've, I'm sure you've heard of it. The maximum is 100%, and you kind of want high numbers. And if I tell you that the R squared of this model, which it literally is 75%, that gives you some interpretive ability. It tells you your model is actually quite good um, at describing this, this variable Y. And the R squared metric, and we'll get to that in a second, is independent of the unit. So even if you, suppose you take your model fit and your data points, namely the Y component of the data points, and just multiply both by two, so you're not changing the fit, you're just kind of rescaling the y variable. It's, it's not going to change the r-squared metric. So it's kind of independent of the units. And that makes it easy because regardless of how you scale your data, the r-squared is invariant to that. OK, so let's get into some more detail of this r-squared metric. So the technical name of it is coefficient of determination. but that's long and painful. Um, so to understand what R squared is, we kind of have to revisit a basic concept of variance. I, f I don't think we formally defined it, but it's very similar to standard deviation. Um, so let's just look at the formula. So variance is, and we have a set of data. We're going to index, symbolize it with x. And so we have x sub i. That's going to refer to the ith data point. So i is going to range between 1 and the number of data points. So to compute variance, we're going to subtract the mean from the ith data point, And we're going to square that and sum. So this um, should remind you. And then the last bit is we're going to divide by the number of data points minus 1. But that's not terribly important. So if you remember what standard deviation is, standard deviation is just this, this exact thing, just square rooted. So standard deviation, it kind of puts your standard deviation, remember, uh, is one way to quantify the spread of some data. Right? It's kind of the average deviation from the mean. Um, variance is just the square of the standard deviation. And so the units are actually not in the same units as, so standard deviation is in the same units. It's kind of linear units, but variance is squaring that. So it's actually a squaring squared units there. But So they're very similar. And it's just quantifying, in some sense, spread from the mean of some data. 
So now, okay, we understand variance, and now we can go back to, we're, we're trying to define R squared, and R squared is very heavily dependent on this concept of variance. So now well, let's turn to that. So as I said, R squared is coefficient of determination, and we're gonna show a simple example. So again, we have one variable trying to predict another. So here are some data points. I think it's the same data points we just saw. And suppose I start with this model. So this model, I mean, it is a model. It, it's a function defined on x, and it's, the function doesn't change. The function actually doesn't depend on x at all. The function is always approximately 21.9. So there's this model that's given by this black line that's trying to fit the data, say. And as you can see, it, it, it's not horrible. It's somewhere near the data points, but it's not doing a great job kind of um, predicting the y coordinate of these data points. So given this model, though, we can still ask how accurate is it. And so we, what we would do is compute um, the sum of the squares of the residuals of this model, which is in some sense identical to variance. Right? So remember what variance was. Just So it's something like relative to the mean, sort of the sum of the squares. Of course, there's this normalization. So in this example, in fact, this black line is the mean of the y. So you just take all the y coordinates of these data points and take the mean of that. That is what I did here. And these blue lines are now the residual, sort of the distance to the mean. So this point is very far from the mean, so there's a big residual. Whereas this data point is pretty close to the mean, and so it's, it's, it, the residual is not so big. So I put these blue lines here to kind of symbolize or visual, let you visualize what the variance in this, these data are. Okay, so let's look at one other case. So let's look at the exact same data points. The y, x and y is exactly the same. Nothing has changed, except that we have a different model now. So this is a model I think I fitted to the data. And just by eye, you can see it's going through the data points a bit better than just this black line here. And so for this new model, we can also plot these little blue lines. So each blue line is just the discrepancy between the data point actually observed. For example, this is, was 20, and the model fit was about 20.7. So this blue line it has a length of you know, 0.7. And so I've done that for every single data point. And so if you just compare how much blue you see on the left versus the right, there's much more blue on the left. And so blue is bad. Blue means your model failed to you know, explain that part of the data set. Whereas this model over here is doing much better than the model on the left. So on the left is this variance idea that it's kind of the raw variance in the data. So it's just deviations from the mean y coordinate. And then on the right, uh, we can call what we see in blue as the unexplained variance. It's a little tricky. It's, it's the blue means you didn't achieve, you didn't go through this data point here, and so all the blue is bad. So that's all the variance you're not explaining. So we call that the unexplained variance. Okay, so now we're, the whole point of this was to define what is the R squared metric, and now we're ready to do that. So conceptually, R squared is just 100 to kind of put it in percent. So 100 times 1 minus this fraction of unexplained variance divided by the total variance. So let me just show you a little arrow. So this variance, we compute something based on the, all the blue here. Of course, we'll get into formally what we do, but that goes into the denominator. And, and the numerator is just the unexplained variance according to this model that's up here. So in some sense, we're kind of comparing the model we actually care about, this quadratic model probably, versus a, a mean model, a model that just gets the mean of the data right. That's kind of what we're doing. And so intuitively, let's think about what the bounds of this metric are. So. Imagine there were, was no unexplained variance. So in other words, imagine we had a model that exactly went through every single data point. So if there, so I'm kind of tracing it out with my cursor. So if we had a model that went through every single data point, there would be no blue lines. There are no residuals, and the numerator would be zero. I guess I haven't shown you what the formula is, but it should be pretty intuitive. That Okay, so if that's zero, then 1 minus 0 divided by some number is 
just one minus zero. So that's just so this whole parentheses just becomes one. And then r squared is going to be 100, so 100 percent, which makes sense. So if if your model perfectly explains all your data, your r squared is going to be 100 percent. Um, so what about the case? So a model could actually be nowhere near the data point. So suppose the model we propose is where my cursor is. So suppose it's all the way down here. So my model is like a line that's really, really, really far from the data point. So then you'll have tons of residuals. And so the numerator might be really large. So one minus large number divided by some constant. So the large is going to dominate the constant denominator. And so this is going to be some really big number. So one minus a really big number will be potentially some really negative number. And then r squared can actually drop below 0. Typically, it doesn't because, well, this gets into some technicality that you at least have. Typically, you do at least as good as sort of the mean model. So r squares tend to be positive. But you can actually drop below 0 if, uh, if the metric is formulated this way. And one other case when r squared is 0. So suppose our model that we have is exactly the model on the left. So if you predict the mean of your data points, then the unexplained variance is the same as just the total variance. So if this was our model, you basically have the same thing in the numerator and the denominator. So that cancels out into 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. And then r squared is just 0. So you can kind of think of 0 as sort of some benchmark. 0 means you got the mean of all your y coordinates, what your y values correct. So you probably want to do a little better than 0 <laughs> because it's in some sense relatively easy to get the mean, right? You just kind of take the mean of your data points and that's sort of a trivial model. Okay, so the big picture is now we have this metric that's commonly used to quantify with some intuitive units how well our model is describing our data. Um, so there are a couple notes that you can kind of read in the lecture notes. I don't want to spend too long because it might be slightly confusing. Um, one is having to do with Pearson's correlation. So remember Pearson's correlation is little r. And we went through, like, what is Pearson's correlation? It's uz score the x-axis, uz score the y-axis, and it's kind of the average dot product. So that um, there is a relationship between Pearson's correlation and this capital R squared, but it's a little subtle. Um, basically, if you if you if you fit a, if you if you allow a linear mo well, how do I say this without being too confusing? Um, if you allow your model to have a scale and offset, so that means you have a parameter that can scale the model, and then also a parameter that can add a constant offset to the model. If you do that, then little r squared is identical. It's equal to this big r squared value, but only if you allow that sort of constant and offset uh, scaling. If you don't, then they're not identical. So, just, so I, I guess you can read the lecture notes to understand that. So you, what you really, to quantify the accuracy of your model, I guess what I'm saying is you should, tech, strictly speaking, use this capital R squared metric, which isn't identical to Pearson's R squared. Okay, so life would be easy if we were done here, but we're not. And essentially the problem is that our, I guess to foreshadow what we'll get into, this R squared value that you might calculate um, will be optimistic. It's going to be a little too high, or actually a lot too high, sort of depending on the complexity of your model. So in some sense it's an overestimate of your of how well your model really does. That's kind of what will what's motivating the whole rest of this, the content here. Um, so I guess intuitively, what you can think about, you have some data like these data points, and suppose I have a model with twenty, suppose a linear model, and I just make up twenty random regressors. So I just suppose you're measuring uh, people's height, and then suppose you allow yourself 
200 different regressors. One is their gender, one is their eye color, and one is their clothes color. You just throw more and more regressors into a model. Eventually the R squared, the capital R squared of, the, of that model will just get higher and higher. It'll start getting closer and closer to 100% explaining um, your, your, your data. Um, so that hopefully gives you some intuition of that it can't, it's too good to be true. We can't just throw more and more parameters at the model and just explain more and more of our data and just have a perfectly um, accurate model that something's, something's, something's awry here. That's weird. Um, okay, so Oh, sorry. <laughs> I skipped ahead. We didn't actually go into the formula that does this equation, and it's it's not terribly hard. So let's just quickly finish that up. So this is what we just saw in the previous slide. So on one hand, we can kind of go further abstract. So you can think of one minus the unexplained fraction as just the fraction you do explain, just a change of terminology. And then we're just multiplying by 100, so that's how you get percent explain variance. So you often hear of oh, the amount of variance I explain in my data is 5%. So that's kind of how you conceptually how you get there from this sort of word equation. And then going more technical, we can go down here. So R squared, so how do we quantify variance? We already saw that. It's just, so, so D now stands for our data. And we just quantify the deviation of each data point from the mean of the data points, and you square, and then you divide by n minus 1, right? So this, this is pretty straightforward for the total variance in our data. And then for the numerator, we're just doing essentially the residuals of our model, right? So d, d sub i is just the ith data point again. And now we're going to subtract off what is the model fit for the ith data point. So that's n, m sub i. So that's the residual, and then we square it and sum, and then we also divide by the same denominator, and then, of course, if you divide that by that, the denominators go away. So we can just simplify it into this. So notice they look very, the numerator and denominator look very similar. The only thing that's changing is, in the bottom, we're kind of putting the mean. So the mean is kind of a model down here, and that sort of sets the benchmark. And then the m sub i is what we actually obtain using the model we care about. And so that this is act the actual formula for how you would compute the R squared for a given model. Does that make sense? Okay, so going back to try to motivate why we're not done, and this is it's the problem of essentially overfitting. Um, so here's an example that I, I kind of conjured up that hopefully helps. So th the claim here is that if you just calculate R squared you know, on the data set you observe, then this is going to be optimistic. It's going to overestimate the true accuracy of, of the model that you have. So in this example, we start off with this kind of hypothetical uh, scenario. So Again, we're trying to model y as a function of x. And in red is our samples, a lot of samples from the population. So I'm just essentially trying to give you a visualization of all the potential um, individuals that we might have measured. And there are a lot. There are maybe a, a thousand here. And the true model, and so the, and what I mean by true model is I started off with the black line and I simulated measurements um, with some noise factor around this model. So for each sample you see here, I just sort of picked an x coordinate and I looked at the, 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 the black line and I sort of simulated some noise on top of that. So the black line is really the underlying sort of model that we're observing through sampling. Wait, in a second we're going to look at the samples, but, but um, so this is sort of ground truth. So the black line is really the underlying function that we're, we're, we're interested in. Okay. So on the right hand side, I'm just going to show you. I think I actually did these simulations. So these are real numbers coming from various simulations. And so we can ask, given this black line, how well does this black line, this true model, um, explain? 
sort of the population of data points that we might have that we might observe. And so as you can see by eye, it, it does a pretty good job ex going through a lot of the data points and the R, capital R squared w for this case would be 80%. So let's just say that's, that's pretty good, that's a high value. Okay, but in reality we don't observe the entire population, we just draw some samples from the population. So now I've shown in blue, I think 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, I don't know, 12, 12 data points. So in reality, we only observe these blue dots shown here. And in reality, we don't know that the true function is this black line. We just observe these blue dots, right? And so we're going to try to fit a model to our, our blue data points to, and sort of hope, hope that that fitted model is a good model for um, the underlying population. So we might ask, we're just going to fill in the rest of these cells here. How well does the true model, so this black line that we in reality don't actually know, but we can ask how well does this black line go through our sample? Our sample was just a random sample, and I just drew, as I said, like 12 data points. And you might imagine, I think the actual R squared is pretty high also. So it just turns out that for this sample of, of 12 data points, the black line has an R squared of pretty high, 79%. Of course, it might vary from sample to sample just because of chance. Okay, so everything's pretty easy so far. But now we're going to get into the interesting case, which is given these samples, suppose we start fitting those data. Because that's the reality is we don't we never observe the red unless you collect that many samples and you don't observe the true model. We just observe our data points and imagine, so what I've done here is I fit some model is probably a quadratic model judging from how it looks I fit a quadratic model to the blue dots and I minimized probably squared error just as you might uh, do yourself and that model I've plotted it out it looks reasonable it's going pretty close to all the blue dots except for this one guy down here and that's what I'm calling the fitted model so we we observe some data we fit the data and we get this light blue line so down here, I've started filling in the second row. It's the fitted model. So the fitted model, this light blue line, we can ask, how well does that model explain our data? Like in this case, are the data we actually observe, our sample? So by eye, it's almost going pretty close through all, as I said, all the data points except for one. So I think the actual R squared value, capital R squared value is 85%. So quite high. So I just say in words, very high. Okay, so one observation to note is that this cell is higher than this cell. So the fitted model on our sample is doing better than the true underlying model on our sample. So 85 is greater than 79. And intuitively, the only the reason why that's the case is the the fitted model has freedom to kind of change itself to fit the data. I mean, that's that's kind of the point. And the true model, the true model was sort of fixed in stone. We're not allowing it to change. It is the true model. And it just turns out, you know, by chance that the true model on this particular random sample was at, you know, it's pretty high, 80. But if you have a, 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 a different model, so we're throwing a model at the sample we observe and allow it to actually morph and change and fit the data, you might imagine very well that you'll fit the data even better than this thing that was already fixed. So that's what's happening here. We, we had a model, I think a quadratic model, and we allowed it to fit our sample. And so not surprisingly, the R squared is getting even larger than the true model. So that's one observation here. So this last cell is kind of the most important, which is the fitted model, namely this light blue line against the population. And it's this last cell that we really care about. We care about not this particular sample we observed. We kind of care about in general, does our model explain, you know, future data or individuals we didn't sample from? And so it would turn out, I think the actual number here is calculated, which is 69%, which is relatively low compared to these other numbers. So intuitively over here, we're basically asking, given our fitted model, this light blue line, how well does that light blue line explain the population, so kind of look at light blue against the red. 
I mean, it's not horrible. It's kind of going in the vicinity of the red dots, but it's not it's not as good as it could be, right? The black line is basically the optimal model because that's the model I use to generate the data. It's so you, another way to think about it is how close is the light blue line to the black line? It's kind of close, but it's not the same. And whatever that difference is, that's why it's not 80%, it's 69%. So the, the other sort of critical comparison, so we already talked about this comparison, 85 versus 79. The other comparison that's really important is this between this. So the fitted model, you know, given the observed data, we, we have, we fit the model, and we look at the R squared on the sample, and we saw it is very high, and we might be happy, oh wow, my R squared is 85%. But the key realization is that the, the true accuracy of the, your fitted model is, is lower. So it turns out to be, in this case, to be 69%. So 85 is substantially larger than the 69% here. And that's, that's really all we're saying when we say that if you just calculate the R squared on your sample, that's an overestimate of how well your, your model is truly doing. So that's just this last part here. Accuracy of the fitted model on the sample you observe will, in general, be an overestimate of the true accuracy of that model. Right, so go back to that example we were trying to predict uh, I forget, height and we just have like throw in 200 regressors, age, gender, clothes color, throw in whatever you want and you start seeing, oh, R squared is going up to like 99%. But if you were to test that model and just collect a new set of individuals, so measure their heights again and eye color, whatever, and check how well that model you obtained actually predicts that data, it's not going to be anywhere near 99%. It'll be maybe like 5% or 10%. So in, in reality, again, we only, um, we only observe our sample and sort of fit. So we're only, we're, we're, we really only observe kind of the bottom row here. We never really have access to the true model because that would involve getting 100 times more data points and like, of course you could do that. But so I guess the key point of this slide is sort of this comparison that in general, if you're talking about the R squared on your sample, just keep in mind that it is an overestimate unless you do something to correct for that. And that's what we're gonna look at next. Any questions on this? So one way to to kind of correct for this issue or is cross validation, which you probably have heard for, of before. And it's it's conceptually very simple. So the goal here, again, if you just compute R squared on your, the data you have, it's sort of bias to be too high. So we really want to estimate that what is the real true unbiased accuracy of the model that we have fit. And to do cross validation is really, really, really simple. What you do is you leave out some of your data and then for the remaining data, we, it's called the training data. That's one way to say what that is. And then on the training data, you do whatever you want. You fit your model you throw in as many regressors as you want, do whatever you want. And then once you're done fitting your model, then you check how well that model is doing on the, the data that you left out in the beginning. And so there's a very close parallel, I don't know if you noticed in this little example here. Um, you can think of all the red dots here as sort of the data I left out. There were 10,000 other individuals I could have sampled from and I would like to sample them, but I could only take 12 individuals. And so how well the light blue line here is explaining the left out data, namely all these red dots, is kind of the, what is, well, that's what cross-validation tries to get at. Right, so cross-validation is giving you, and of course it's an estimate always in the end, of, but it's giving you this cell. It's trying to tell you how well your fitted model will do on the population from which you're drawing your data from.
Okay. So there are a lot of different flavors of cross-validation having to do with exactly which data, how much data to leave out, and sort of do you do this multiple times and so forth. And you can read the lecture notes, I guess, for I just mentioned a couple of them. Um, but um, the, a simple one, and one that gives you, I guess, the gist of all these different types is leave one out cross-validation. So here's a little diagram that shows how that works. So we have some data. It just symbolizes blocks. So we have six data points, not that many. And we're going, I'm going to use color to indicate different iterations of this process. Red will mean the data points used to train our model or fit our model. And then gray is data that we'll use to test the model. So in the first iteration, I'm just going to leave out the first data point. So I'm just going to put that aside. I guess I used gray for a reason. So it looks like we're using all our red data points to fit our model. OK, the next time around, we'll leave out the second one and then used, use all the data points except the second one to fit our model and then so on and so forth. So there's six, because we have six data points, we have six iterations here. Each time we're leaving out one of the data points. OK, so now each time we do this, we're going to ask the model that we fit to predict the, the one data point we left out. Right? So this first iteration, let me back up. We have these five data points. We fit a model trying to you know, predict the variable that we care about. And then given our best, our fit, we're going to ask that model, what's the prediction for that first data point? So that first data point, of course, we have all the regressors and the y value, but we're, we're ignoring that for a sec. We're going to ask our model, we fit it on these five data points and ask that model, what's your best prediction for what the y value is for that data point we left out? So we do exactly the same thing in each of our other iterations. In this case, we fit the first, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth data point and ask that model that we fit to predict this data point, and so on and so forth. So after the end of that process, we're going to collect together all of our predictions. Right? So predictions, maybe I'll just mention. So the prediction is just, you know, suppose we have this light blue model and our prediction for this one data point. So where my cursor is, the x value is 1.9 approximately. And there's a data point right here. So the prediction of the light blue model for when x is 1.9 would be something like right here. It would be the predicted y value would be 3.2 or something. So that's all we're t saying. So the prediction for this left out data point, suppose I left out the data point right here, the prediction would be 3.2, whereas the real y value is something like 2. So that's all we're talking about. So we collect together all of these predicted, the prediction for the first data point, the prediction for the second data point, Prediction for the third data point, fourth, fifth, and sixth. We just collect all of those predictions here. So you just think of all these little gray boxes getting strung together here. And then we just quantify how well that actually matches the data we, we, we observed. And so you take your data, your original data, take all your predictions, and then calculate your metric of accuracy. So you can calculate R squared here. So there's really not much going on other than the R squared that we're computing is not on sort of the fitted model against the data. It's on sort of all of these model predictions against the data. Yeah, so k-fold cross value is mentioned in lecture notes. So that's, as you said, like you could divide your data points randomly into five groups and then leave out, just do five iterations, leave out a fifth, train and predict the fifth, and then so on and so forth. Um, so I guess I lay out some of the issues um, in the lecture notes as to what 
you might consider when you're deciding. So one, the main one really is computational time. So if that wasn't an issue, so I mean, of course at some point it'll become an issue. If you have a thousand data points and each iteration takes 10 seconds, that's 10 times a thousand seconds and it's not horrible, but you know. But so yeah, depending on your data set, maybe computational time might be an issue, in which case that would be a reason to not do so many iterations. So you can go down to maybe tenfold. So tenfold for a thousand data points would mean you leave out a hundred data points at a time. Um, generally speaking, I mean, you want to you don't want to leave out too much data because if you have less data, you you can do less with. If you have only ten data points, you know you're not going to be able to fit a very good model. Whereas, you know, if you have a hundred data points, you can. So, if you leave out too much data for for testing, that's a bad thing from the point of view of having data to train on. So you kind of want don't, you don't want to leave out too many. Um, and also, if you, if the more uh, predictions you do, the more stable your estimate of your prediction accuracy will be. Right. So imagine I only did one iteration. Suppose I decided. Well, suppose each square w was uh, ten data points, so we have sixty. So imagine I took fifty data points fit some model and then predicted the 10 we left out. That's okay, but suppose that that's all you did, and then you'll just have you know, 10 data points and 10 predictions, and then you'll sort of quantify how well we're doing um, in terms of R squared or in terms of percent correct or something. Let's do percent correct, it's easier to think about. So if you have 10 trials and you're trying to uh, predict whether it was yes or no, that's, you know, by chance you might get five right. And so that already, you know, we have very few trials that we're trying to do better than chance, probably. And so having only 10 trials is kind of a bad thing, because then you'll have to get probably nine right to, to be provably better than sort of random guessing. However, so that was only if we did one split. But if we did sort of leave, I guess, six-fold cross-validation, so instead of leaving out just 10 and predicting 10, we also do all the other combinations, then we'll have 60 trials you know, on which to try to do better than chance. So chance on 60 trials might be 30, then maybe you only need to get like 40 right out of 60 to get, you know, P less than 0.05 or 0.01 or something. So the other issue that I'm alluding to here, I guess, is you also want a large number of prediction samples because that'll kind of stabilize your, your measure of prediction accuracy. So there are comp competing concerns. Um, and if, if computational time is not an issue, you could just, just as well go out to the extreme case, which is leave one data point out and do that as, you know, as many times as you have data points. Um, yeah, so it's just really just, I don't think there's a clear like answer since it depends on subjective things like how long it takes your code to run. Okay. So popping up to the big picture, right? So cross-validation, and in particular, we are looked at one specific flavor of cross-validation. But what that, again, does allows you to do is sort of get at a number that's sort of not an overestimate. And that's sort of a better reflection of the accuracy of the model you have. OK, so next up, we're going to look at um, this concept of overfitting. Um, you probably have heard of overfitting in it, and there's, it's definitely related to cross-validation, and I guess this slide is just another, another way to think about these, this, this issue of why you even have to do any of this at all. So in this case, again, predicting one variable from another, y from x, and this is the sort of model that I'm going to simulate some data from. So that's why I can say it's the true model. So for, for, for given this function, I'm now going to plot some simulated data. So what I've done is for each x value from 1 to 10, I drew some samples. So for x equals 1, maybe I took 10 samples. And then now I'm showing you the mean and standard error. So imagine we collected you know, 10 observations when x was 1, 10 observations when x was 2, 10 when x is 3, and so forth. And I'm summarizing all 10 values just by showing you the mean and I'm going to plot an error bar to indicate plus or minus one standard error. And this, 
of course, we talked about how to bootstrap and so forth. But here, I think I'm just doing the standard sort of standard deviation divided by square root of n. So in this case, square root of 10. So here are some data we observe, right? We never really observe the black line. We only observe our noisy data points. So we observe these, these red data points. So given these data points, maybe we want to fit a model to this, these data and try to summarize what, what the data are telling us. So on this side, we're going to plot some um, observations of that, or characteristics of that process. So on the y-axis, we have uh, squared error. It's really the mean squared error, just so we can get all of these plot elements on the same axis, but it doesn't matter too much. And the x-axis, we're going to plot the complexity of the model we're going to use. So specifically, we're going to use some polynomials to model this these data. So, right, so this is like if you have a linear model is a polynomial with a degree one. So that would kind of be here. If you go up to quadratic, that's degree two. If you go up to cubic, that's degree three and so forth. And if you're degree zero, that is really the model y equals constant. So that can only do something like a horizontal line. You can't even have a slope. So that's the x-axis, and we're going to start plotting some lines here in red and black. So we're going to start off here with a simple model. Okay, so I just put up a model that's in light blue. So what I've done is I fit this model in it, the actual model specifications up here, y equals a. So a is a free parameter, and I'm going to ask, given this model, how well can I describe the data? Again, shown in red. So the mean... So y equals a is really just a model that's trying to get the mean right. And the mean of all the red data points in the y direction is 5.2, it looks like. And that's my model. So that's, it's trying to fit the red data points and it's, it's, in, it's in the vicinity of the red data points, which is good, but it's not really getting any of these fluctuations. So given that model, we can compute something like, well, well, mean squared error of this model. So you compare the light blue line against the red dots and you get a squared error, a mean squared error of approximately 3.4. And so that's why I put a dot right there. And so I'm labeling this the sample, the sample again being what we actually observe. So you do a straight squared error calculation on the sample and you get this. But what's more important, and I'm also going to plot that, is the population. That is, given this model, how well would this model explain further experiments, for example? So if we were to sample some new data points and then check how well our blue line describes those data points, I've actually done those simulations and the performance of um, the model is shown in this black dot here. So it's about 5.5. All right, and I guess one thing to note is Notice it's much, already it's, a, it's an overestimate. So the red is already much smaller than black. Black is sort of the true accuracy, and already we can see there's a, over, you know, it's too optimistic in terms of what the squared error is. Okay, so now in the next frame, we're just going to increase the complexity of the model. We're going to allow it to be aligned with some slope. So now I've just done it. So now our model is just y equals ax plus b. Now there's two free parameters. There's we still have this sort of constant parameter that we used to have, but now we have this other parameter that controls the slope. So there's, this is just a linear model. And the fit of that model to these data points, the same red data points is shown in blue. So notice, you can see by eye it's doing the right thing. It's kind of slanted downward. That allows it to get closer to the data points. And the corresponding values for how well this model is doing on, this, on the right-hand side, so notice the fit on our sample is better, as expected. We're throwing another parameter at the model, so it's going to be able to reduce the error a bit more than our previous model. That's why the red line goes down. And on the population, the error also is going down. So you can think of what the population line here is plotting is how close is this blue fitted model to the underlying true model. And you know, in the previous slide, it wasn't really close at all. But now by tilting a little, it's a little closer to the black line. 
So that's good. So using a linear model as opposed to a constant model is improving our true performance. So now let me just a little more quickly step through the next couple. So next we're going to do a quadratic, so that's here. So it didn't really help that much. The error went down a little bit on our sample, also went down a little bit on our population. Let's go to cubic. So there that made a huge difference. So now notice the blue line is going pretty close to a lot all the data points and that decreased our error on our sample a lot and also decreased our error on the population. So notice the blue line and the black line are now very close. So it seems like a very good model. So let's go to Cortic now. So the fourth degree, throw in one more regressor. Now we see something interesting. It decreased the error in our sample a bit, a little bit, but now our error on the population is going up. So let me go to fifth degree. So watch fifth. Didn't change too much. Let's go to sixth degree and seventh degree. So I think that's the last degree I used here. So look at this model. It's it's going very close and is doing a lot of wiggly stuff to get close to the red data points. But notice, if you remember, the cubic model is actually much closer to the black line than this blue line is now. And that's reflected in the fact that the error of our fitted model as shown in the black is a bit higher than we were when we were at the cubic. So let me just quickly step through all those degrees again. So this is pretty bad doing better, doing a little bit better, doing very good, and then beyond this, the blue line kind of goes out of whack and starts getting further away from the black line. Okay, so there, so the shapes of these two curves are very different. One is always monotonically decreasing, so the red always goes down. So by different amounts, of course, depending on what degree we're at, but it's always going down. Whereas the black line, it goes down but then starts going up. And so there's some optimal point. And by optimal, I mean the minimum of this black function. And so you can kind of think of models that are, excuse me, less than cubic down in this regime are underfit. They're not fitting the data enough. Whereas if you go beyond cubic, those models fit the data too much. So this, as we're showing the seventh degree model here, this, this blue line is fitting too much it's getting too close to the data points, and that's hurting its its generalization performance. That is the how well it will describe the population. So there's that term overfit. You kind of you, overfitting is bad. You don't want to use too complex of a model. So that's that would be you're out in this regime because you will be overfitting, fitting too much of your data. And I guess conceptually, why why is it bad to fit the data too much? The, the reason is your data is going to be some mix of signal and noise. And so there's going to be some random fluctuations in your data set, which we can loosely define as noise. And you don't want your model to kind of fit all of those random fluctuations. You wanted to fit it some of it, because your data is not all noise, hopefully. <laughs> um, but you don't want to fit all of your data because that would include fitting all the random fluctuations that are just due to chance. So, so cross-validation is really a way of trying to get at this black, this black line here. So if you do your cross-validation right, you will often observe your performance will have like a U shape. So if you fit too simple of a model, you're kind of in this regime. If you fit too complex of a model, you'll be in this regime, and there's going to be some optimum middle point where you kind of get your best, best predictive model. And so you might be comparing two completely different models. Maybe you have like a exponential model y equals a to x to the n and you might want to compare it against a quadratic polynomial model and then you can cross-validate both models and start using that as a criterion to select 
which is the better model for your data. You can't just, so you can't just use R squared, right? The, the usual R squared, because you could have a, a thousand parameter model that gets R squared of 100% or 99.9%, but that's not, that's an, that's an overestimate of how well that model actually does. Okay, any questions on this? All right, so as I kind of already been foreshadowing, there's this idea of complexity of models. So here's a little example that hopefully helps you get some handle of these concepts. So we're going to contrast two models. So one's a pure linear model. The other one is some high order polynomial, so maybe quartic or fifth degree or something. And we're going to, I guess the point of the slide is to show you that which model you want to use kind of depends on the nature of your data, namely like how much noise there is and how much, how much data you have. So in each of these quadrants, I'm going to simulate some, the exact same function. And we have two different regimes. One is there's a lot of noise and the other is there's low noise. So I think we're going to start down here. So this is the underlying function. I'm going to simulate some data from that. And so each red dot is some data point that we might observe. And this is the low noise regime. So notice the scatter around this underlying function is very small. So just by eye, if you look at the data points, you can kind of see the structure um, of, the, of, the, of the data. So given these red data points, we might want to fit, say, a linear model. So if we fit that model, so I actually fit the model, and the best fitting line is this line here. And I summarize this. I mean, it, it, it's a very good model. It is capturing the trend in the data, that it's a downward trend, and it is pretty close to most of the data points. So all in all, it is a good model. But I'm saying here, just to drive home the point of the slide, that this regime is the models fitting too little. We can actually fit more of the data and do even better than what this line is doing. But so that's why I say that this linear model in the low noise regime is fitting too little of the data. Okay, so now let's go to this case, I think. So here is some data. Actually, these are the exact same data as the case on the left. So they're identical. But now suppose given these data points, we fit a very complex high order polynomial model. So that's shown in blue again here. Notice it's reasonable, it's going through the data points and it's actually doing a bit better than our linear model that we saw over here. And we'll summarize this as it's fitting quite well. It's almost identical to the black function that we simulated the data from. Okay, so now let's go up to these regimes. So over here, same underlying function, we just cranked up the noise. So due to whatever reason, depending on what system you're measuring, there's variability when you observe individuals or subjects or whatever from this function. And so you can think of the noise, the noise spread is just getting scaled by a factor of five or even 10 compared to this case. So you crank up the noise and then you start observing these red data points. Then to these data points, you fit a line it's doing the right thing, it's getting the downward trend. It actually looks very similar to the line down here. I guess I'm omitting the axes, but just by eye you see that it's pretty close. And now I'm going to summarize this. Of course the R squared in this case is going to be much lower than this case, but I'm going to say as a summary here that the line is actually doing quite well, which is kind of sort of the opposite conclusion I had down here. And the reason is, it's, it's, is, is, is it kind of depends on the, the noise level in our data. So if we have very little noise, we can kind of fit our line and notice that it's actually, we, can do much, we can actually do better. So in this case, we think the line is not doing as great as we can. Whereas here, when the variability is so high, you know, we probably can't do much better than a line for these types of data. So the, the, to sort of drive that point home, let's see this case. So the, exactly the same data points as we saw here, the noise level is very high. And then we take these data and fit our very complex model to it. So I forget what degree, maybe 10th degree polynomial, so many parameters. 
and it's trying to go through all of these small fluctuations in the data and it's doing the right thing you can kind of see it it goes up a bit here because of these data points and then kind of goes down to capture these and so forth and so that's fine we we fit the model we observe it and unfortunately we it's probably overfit to the data we we don't really know unless we know the true model or if we do something like cross validation but Hopefully it's clear by eye that it's it's fitting too much of these little fluctuations um, in the sense that most of those fluctuations is probably noise. And in this in this case we're showing in this diagram, it is noise because I sort of fixed the true model to the black line and these wiggles in the blue are you know wiggles that are just due to randomness due to observing these data points. So I guess the bottom line is, you know, whether a line is a simple model is good or not kind of depends on the noise level and also depends on the number of data points. So these kind of trade off to kind of, they will jointly determine how much effective data you have. So you, you want more data points and you want low noise on those data points. So you might have low noise, but only a few data points and that's not good, or you might have if you have high noise but observe a hundred times as many data points as we observe here, you can actually start fitting complex models. So it, both factors will affect the complexity of the model you can apply. So on, on this other side, this, this complex model, you can use the complex model if you have low noise and plenty of data points. If you simply crank up the noise, then this complex model no longer does very well. So the moral of the story, I guess, is it depends. You can't really know up front whether your simple model or your complex model will work because it will depend on how much data you have and how, you know, what's the inherent variability of your data relative to the effect that you're trying to characterize. And that you can't say a priori what, what that is. You really just have to analyze your data and kind of figure it out. <laughs>